Um, welcome to today's webinar. Very interesting subject matter, which some of you, uh, which is why we're getting quite a number of um, joiners, um, exploring the, the pros and cons of four day working week. And um, we, we know there's some councils um, exploring this and we've got um, uh, people going to explain to you how it actually works. So my name's Steve Davis. I'm a past president of PPMA. I'm currently the treasurer and secretary of the PPMA. My pleasure to welcome you all to the call and to um, introduce the session. So I'll hand over to um, um, Ange Poppet, who's from Tile Hill, and she will um, fully outline what's in store for us today. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Much appreciated. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're, we're looking at exploring the four day working week um, and what that means from a work life balance, pro productivity perspective, and hopefully trying to tailor that across to the public sector as much as possible. So um, you've got some relevant takeaways today. Um, I'm Ange, um, as Steve kindly um, introduced me, I'm one of the associate directors here at Tile Hill, um, and, and I spend a lot of my time talking to HR professionals and hence kind of the, the topic of the webinar today. Um, in a moment, I'm going to let Joe Ryle and Aidan Rave introduce themselves. There are two panel members today, um, and that will be followed by a couple of questions from myself, um, which the panel will discuss. Um, we'll delve further into some of the practicalities of creating a four-day working week, um, as well as sharing some of the data and the impact that it's had in other organisations where they've held trials. Um, we'll then hopefully have a bit of time to open the floor for questions from, from you guys in the audience. Um, but don't worry, if we're unable to kind of answer your question due to the time limitations of today, please do feel free to contact the PPMA team or myself afterwards, and we'll aim to get those answered outside of the session today as well, um, just so that you feel fully informed, or if you'd like us to connect you into any of the speakers, again, more than happy to do so. Um, and on that note, um, I'm going to let jo uh, Joe tell us a little bit more about himself, if that's all right, Joe. <clears throat> Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ange. So I'm Joe Ryle. I'm director of the four day week campaign Um, we're the kind of national campaign in the UK campaigning for a four day, 32 hour working week or less um, with no loss of pay for workers. Um, we've led on some of the big trials that you may have read about in the media. There was um, the biggest ever trial in the world so far, which took place in the UK last year. Uh, the results for that were out in February. They were very promising, um, you know, over, over, overwhelmingly a kind of win-win really for workers and employers in terms of the productivity gains, but also then the, the gains for, for well-being for workers. So, I'll, yeah, I'll leave it there, keep it short to start, and then hopefully we've got lots of time for questions. Thanks for introducing me. Thanks, Joe. Aidan, would you like to tell us um, a little bit about you? Hi, everybody. Thanks, Angie. Yeah, apologies, I just had to dash off because, of course, the doorbell rang as soon as the... the, the, the um, uh, the session started. It's always the case. <laughs> always the case. Apologies for that. Uh, Aidan Rave, yeah, I am a uh, former local authority chief executive uh, and elected member. I guess that's the perspective I'll bring to this. I currently work for Good Governance Institute as a principal consultant. We support organisations around governance. Who knew that's what uh, the, it says on the tin. Uh, really interested in this discussion um, and, and hopefully... Um, can bring something of a, of a practitioner perspective to some of the thinking and uh, I'd be really interested to hear from from you guys of what you because you, you're at the you know the front line of this I'd be interested to hear your perspective on where the discussion is um where it needs to go really and, and how we can tackle some of the very practical obstacles such as government ministers and things like that to uh, to, to get further towards a, a kind of a conclusion to this brilliant thank you Aidan um I'm going to go straight into the questions on that basis. Um, I'm going to start with you, Joe, actually. So, you know, you as you mentioned earlier, you guys have worked with a number of different organisations, including some local government and wider public sector bodies. Um, what do you think are some of the practical considerations that our attendees on the screen here should be thinking about before and during a journey of implementing a four day working week within their organisations? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the question of, of whether you can implement a four day week in local councils or, in, you know, some public sector organisations can often be one of whether it's possible to implement more broadly across the economy, because, you know, the range of services that a council delivers is really, really broad, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, 
So in the, in the case of South Cambridgeshire District Council, who were the first ever UK council to go ahead with a trial, um, you know, for them, what they did was they, they first of all, they started with the kind of white collar workers, the office based workers, and were kind of, you know, committed to a three month trial there. And But they set out from the beginning, which I think worked quite well, they know that they had the intention, if that was successful, to then look to expand that out to the rest of the workforce. And so, you know, there's been a whole host of challenges to, to work through to make this a reality. Um, you know, you can you can see how with kind of desk based office based work, it can be in in some cases simpler to implement. Um, although having said that, you know, there is a lot of desk based work that is more kind of customer service facing, you know, maybe have to kind of maintain working patterns over five days or six days or even seven days. So there's definitely challenges there. And I think where they ended up was they they had a kind of rotation of days off. I think it was a, roughly about half of the staff were having Mondays off and about half the staff were having Fridays off. And so, you know, there's all those considerations for them to think about. Um, that, you know, the trial has gone very well so far, very successfully. You wouldn't know that if you read the kind of the government's response to it, but it has broadly been a very successful trial. And they're now looking to expand it out, you know, using that kind of confidence they've got to expand it out to the rest of the workforce, which just includes, you know, bin, bin staff, you know, shared waste services with Cambridge City Council. Um, so, so again, it's, you know, it's a really different set of um, things to think about there. And the way they've done that is by, um, there's, there's a kind of small cost to start off with so they've, they've I think they've paid for one more uh, bin truck um but actually already they're finding that because there's such a such an issue of job retention uh crisis in in, in local government I think it's nine in ten nine in ten councils are struggling with job retention issues at the moment um already they found even that even though the, the trials not even got underway in the shared waste services already they're finding that they've been able to hire for jobs they just haven't been able to hire for for years so that's really their priority there and I think you know that's that's one thing that's that's, that's worth being really clear about you know what are you trying to achieve when moving to a four-day week and being really clear about that in, in the case of South Cambridge it really is around you know the, the kind of job retention issues um, and and as an organization how do you support um potential organizations that do want to trial a four-day working week yeah so mainly we've been doing kind of comm support um on, on this trial but we do run um a kind of four-day week rollout program which we run a couple of times a year which kind of takes takes organizations on the journey of moving to a four-day working week we usually say you want to leave around about three months to prepare you know once making the decision to do it and then kind of going ahead you, you know three months is a good amount of time and that will involve you know a whole host of conversations with your staff and with your employees about how to make this possible and in some cases that will be tweaking and, and rethinking working patterns are there ways in which you know things can be speeded up or improved or or are there even bits of work that people are doing that don't necessarily contribute to the overall kind of goals of your organization so lots of those conversations will happen in that three month trial period and so it it really is yes you're working less hours you know it very much is about working less it's also about working differently and working smarter and yeah we found the best implementations of a four week are ones in which those conversations happen with staff beforehand they can be really really rewarding you know can really really bring the team together just kind of because you've got that kind of that goal at the end to get that extra day off brilliant thank you joe um aiden you know with your former roles local government chief exec previous elected member um to, from that perspective what do you envisage would be some of the challenges um that the you know officers hr directors chief execs would get when they're considering this type of arrangement in in the local government context well, i mean there are obviously practical problems that joe just mentioned and you know we are i think we're talking fundamentally about public service here aren't we? we're talking about the public services so you know there are practical problems in the in terms of overcoming the the kind of expectation of a five if not seven day a week service being compressed into five i don't think any of those are insurmountable um and, and i'm sure joe and his team have, have, have kind of researched you know the, the solutions to these um I mean, I started out on this uh, discussion, not from necessarily an advocacy of a four day week approach per se, but actually from a concern that, you know, whether it be local government, where it be NHS, where I'm, I'm involved more at the moment, there's a value proposition challenge for employers in a very, very competitive market. And you'll all know this because you're dealing with it every single day of your lives. And so in that competitive market, we need to ensure that we have the ability to attract and retain the very best staff. And we know that some of that, some of it's about money, of course, it's some of it's about prestige, some of it's about uh, professional background, but some of it is about 
terms and conditions. It's about the, the kind of quality of life. It's about the flexibility that the employer offers. It's about the investment that the employer makes in the employee. And so I think that's kind of where um, we need to be exploring this discussion and understanding the potential for local government and for other parts of the public sector to gain that kind of competitive advantage. In terms of the, the real challenges, though, beyond the practical ones, uh, Ange, I mean, I think the, the, the key one is politics, actually. We can't forget the politics of this. And, and we saw that and we've seen that in, in absolute kind of technicolor in terms of the South Cambridgeshire debate, haven't we, with the government actually getting involved in the debate and basically, um, you know, trying to slap the council on the wrist, which which is an avowed localist doesn't play with me from the outset. But but I think, and you know, and I, I put a piece in the MJ a couple of weeks ago on this. I, whatever I think about the government um, involving itself in this discussion, you can't disagree with the fact that there is a political aspect to this and that political oh. aspect needs to be bottomed out. And I think, you know, rather than let um, others do that, like, rather than let the kind of commentariat do that, I think we need to own that as the sector. We need to understand the politics of this. We need to test the politics of it. We need to, you know, stress test it almost to the point where, whatever the challenge is thrown back we've we've already started to understand and work out what the, the implications of it are i'm not saying that's going to be easy um because there are people who will instantly see this as you know work shy public sector trying to get away with um you know you, you can see the headlines you can see them now you you, you well, see them card, you. every day <laughs> So we, we, we've got to, we cannot kind of wish those away. We can't pretend they don't exist. We've got to take them and grab them with both hands and really kind of work to the bottom of how do we answer every question. I think actually that's the biggest challenge. I think the practical challenges, as I say, I think Joe and his colleagues and, and all of you on the call are dealing with and can deal with competently. The political one's the big one and we, we can't ignore it. Brilliant. Thank you, Aidan. Um, is there anything you wanted to add to that, Joe? Um, no, I mean, I agree, you know, the, the kind of Daily Mail headlines do write themselves. Um, but, you, but you know, I think we've got to look at this in, in a kind of more historical context. You know, it's been it's been 100 years since we moved from a six day working week to a five day working week in many, many respects. You know, four day week is, is long overdue. And, you know, if you think about, you know, I agree with Aidan around the kind of competitiveness of, of the you know, public sector trying to compete with the private sector. But, you know, if you look at the last 13 years, public sector and local government have had budgets cut every single year. And you know, this is a way in which local government and council are saying that we can innovate, we can we can do this, we can find our own way, you know, very much local, you know, lo local led, you know, led by local democracy, our own way to kind of make things work. And we, I think it's absolutely, you know, I, I do think it was shocking that the government intervened in the way they tried to Um particularly because it had the you know at the very basis it's just a trial at this stage you know no, no one's saying this I'm not even saying it necessarily is going to work in local councils you know we're, we're trying to find that out um and you know it's really encouraging so far and I'm pleased they've expanded that uh by by another year and actually as a result of the I was saying just before the call as, as a result of the um government's letter we've now got another about 10 councils in a working group who are interested in, in bringing forward their own trials so we'll see what happens there but, you know, I, I really do think it, it is time for change when it comes to working hours. And, the, you know, the COVID pandemic has given us that opportunity to, to totally rethink the world of work and to make it work for, for most people. OK, thank you. Um, and then kind of bringing it back to perhaps, you know, we, we all think data, statistics, et cetera, help inform our decisions. We use analytics a lot, um, uh, uh, you know, across the public sector and, and also within our own sectors. Um, with the work that you've been doing, Joe, um, what's the data shown in terms of things like the important questions here are going to be productivity, engagement, attraction, retention across the workforce? And, and if you could distill that down to some of the statistics you've had, particularly from local government, that'd be really very much appreciated. Yeah. So the first, the biggest ever trial in the, in the public sector actually took place in Iceland a couple of years ago. Um, it was run by the Iceland government and was across the public sector um, in various institutions, including healthcare. And they, you know, there there was an initial extra cost. I think there was some additional staff they had to hire initially, but over the three or four year period, because 
because of the savings that were made through job retention, also through staff just working better, you know, you, you, it tends to be the case, and this is nine times out of ten, you know, when when staff are better rested, they do then bring that back into the workplace, you know, performing better in their roles, and that's where most of the productivity gains come from. It's, it's being better rested, but it's also then being more motivated to perform better in their role. And so that that trial in Iceland was overwhelmingly successful. Um, you know, productivity went up, the well-being of workers dramatically went up, and in the end, it was cost neutral over that three-year time period. And as a result, I think now eighty-six percent of Iceland's population, you know, it's a small country, but um, eighty-six percent of the population have now reduced their hours uh, with no loss of pay. Um, and again, the early evidence from from South Cambridgeshire, which is the only you know big local government trial we've got in the UK is, is very, very similar. You know, um, I think it was nine out of, so the, so the data was analysed by um, the Bennett Institute at the University of Cambridge, um, totally independently. And they found that nine out of 16 areas monitored showed substantial improvement just over that three months. Um, I think there was already savings of around £300,000 just because they've been able to hire for, for, for jobs that we were never able to hire to hire for before. I think it was, I think it was two million pounds was being spent every year on agency staff to, to, to plug some of these gaps. And already, you know, they've they've really made a dent into that. And that's, you know, I should emphasize that's at the point where um they haven't actually, you know, they haven't actually made any commitment to the four-day week at this point. So even though even though they haven't made that commitment, so any new staff joining, no, it's only a trial. You know, it's already making a huge, huge dent in the job retention issue. So, yeah, it really has been. And and again, just the last point I'll make is that you know that 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 data from um, the Bennett Institute showed that the, not no area of, of performance that is is measured showed any kind of concern. Um, so we'll see. That's that's the kind of first three months. Let's see where we are in in, the, in another six months. But but really, really, really encouraging so far. Thanks, Joe. Pam, I've noticed that you've put a quick comment about evidence. Hopefully that helps to kind of give you an idea um, from recruitment and retention. Um, Joe, do you know if there's a link to the data collected by the Bennett Institute and whether we can share that with, with some of the individuals on, on the call? Yes, there is. I will dig it out while we're on the call and I'll post it in the chat. Lovely. Thank you so much. Aidan, was there anything that you wanted to add? I mean, just a, a kind of personal reflection that I, I visited a few years ago um, the Google headquarters down in London, ju just quite serendipitously, because the, the guy who ran it happened to be in our patch in South Castephen. And um, it, it's just interesting kind of listening to Joe's reflections on, on kind of the wider economy, if you like, that the approach that they were taking. Now, no, Google's probably a fairly extreme example. It's at the, the very kind of beanbag end of the economy. We know that. But the approach they were taking was very much that they were moving away from the kind of notion of, of kind of regulation. It was very much about task. It was very much about recognising flexibility in terms of their employees um, and ensuring that they had um, the opportunity to be able to fulfil the task in an environment that, that, that kind of was conducive to that. And in a time frame that was business critical still, but but ultimately, you know, they, they got their opportunity to do it how they wanted. And I'm not saying, you know, just because Google does it, therefore local government should do it. But this is that point about we, we need to be open eyed to what's going on in the wider economy, because the, you know, if, if Google do it one day, then several other parts of the economy will do it the next day. And, and, and you know, and, and I think Steve's made the point, you know, if, if everybody moves to a four day week, well, the recruitment and retention angle disappears. Well, I think the point is we if, if we don't keep up with that debate, then we'll become less competitive as a result of the rest of the economy moving in that direction. Um, and, and I think that goes for kind of flexibility as a whole. So it, it's it's telling there's some CIPD research, which I might, I'll try and dig out if I can do it on the call, I'll stick it in the, the chat, but I was reading it a while ago and it was, um, it was, it was saying basically that the that, you know, I think it's something like 80% of companies haven't tried this yet. So we're, we're still in it. Joe may know that figure better than I, but I think it's a relatively small section that have uh, moved to it. But of, of those who have, almost all are sticking with it, which is really telling, um, you know, because the, the, these people aren't in it for the fun of it. You know, <laughs> they are in it predominantly to to turn a book aren't they i mean that's what they're there for yeah. in, in the private sector so they're doing it because they think it's going to make, make them more competitive I, I i you know go back to my fundamental point we can't afford to ignore that 
And it's interesting, isn't it? Because it is, you know, working in the recruitment or talent industry, the conversations I generally have with chief execs, HR directors, anybody that sits at the top table is we've got a massive recruitment and retention issue. Um, and, and hopefully what, what today's given is some insightful points, a few things for people to think about and a lot of food for thought to kind of take back. And I imagine there's going to be a lot of questions for that. Um, so I thank thank you both for your time. I think I've noticed there's one question. I think Steve, you're helping us with um, with the questions, aren't you? Um, so if we could just open the floor up to to any questions from the audience, um, and and we can try and answer those in the in the final kind of eight or nine minutes that we've got left. And anything we don't, um, I promise we will collate and come back to you. Thanks, Jaron Aiden. Yeah, I, I suppose one of the questions that was in the chat, thank you, um, uh, Joe and Aidan, um, was saying about uh, the, the combination of hybrid working with the four day working week. Um, and Rob's asking uh, if there's any kind of successful formula for that and whether you've come across that, uh, Joe, in the, the work that you've been doing with companies. Yeah, I can quickly answer on that. I mean, I, I think they definitely can be considered together. And I know, I know there's a there's quite a few organizations who have got to the point where they're like, well, look, we've just spent years working out this hybrid working thing. We're not ready to do the four day week now. You know, we've just, but actually, I, you know, I do think they do relate to each other quite well. And personally, I, I think, you know, I think there's a real benefit to being in the office. I'm not saying that needs to be every day, but I do think there's there's real benefit to that kind of coming together as as people and and you know, you can work work better in many cases um but, but but maybe that's two days in the office two days at home or three days in the office one day at home I don't know but I think you know I think it should be flexible for everyone to work out what's best for their organization but absolutely I think they can be considered together thanks uh one of the questions for me um with the trials that have uh, been undertaken um I mean you talked uh, initially before we joined uh, during the call with everybody, Joe, about you tend to sort of tend to just do um, uh, you, you attach your non-working days to the weekend. But I just wonder with the companies that are doing it um, on the trials, did they look to swap around the days? So perhaps have um, a potentially a Wednesday or a Tuesday or a Thursday, so they didn't link it. So you, you're still potentially getting um, an extra day off, but it's not necessarily attached to the weekend. Was there any trials that looked at that? Yeah, and, and and the UK one in, included that. I mean, the most popular option is to have a kind of Friday off, um, followed by a Monday. So, so you get that kind of three day weekend. And um, but of course, it's just not possible for, for some organisations, especially as you know the workplace. You know, the, the world of work is still so dominated by this kind of nine to five five day week. As that changes, maybe there'll be more 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 flexibility. But while that still dominates, you know, there's been all sorts of different patterns. Yeah, and and, and sometimes that'll be. A whole organization with some having Monday off, some having Wednesday off, some having Friday off, or, or for some organizations, it will just be particular departments. You know, for example, if you've got a kind of media team, you know, the media doesn't doesn't stop writing stories on a Friday. So they may have to rotate, you know, have a different but they may even in their department have different day off and um, to make sure they've got the whole coverage across that week. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. And yeah, as long as from our point of view, as long as the, the reduction in hours is the, is broadly the same across the board, it doesn't matter too much. And we think it should be as flexible as possible. One of the things um, I, I was wondering, and I haven't looked enough at the South Cam's um, trial, was um, how they've managed the um, equal pay issues. Because if they've only got a portion of their workforce doing the four day week, I mean, uh, and then other more frontline ones are not doing it, they've got, surely I've got equal value claims sitting in there. I think because it was just a trial, um, you know, so staff kind of more informally opted into that trial rather than changing contracts. I think they're OK. And I think because they were very, very clear from the outset that they're definitely going to expand it to the rest of the workforce as long as the three months trials is, is successful. I think that that brought in, you know, everyone was kind of on board in that way. But, yeah, I, I do think there's a real risk in in not showing the path to including everyone. Otherwise, you are going to risk uh, creating resentment, I think, for, for, for some section of the workforce. Mm -hmm. The other thing actually touching on equal, but I was just thinking for some organisation, well, sorry, local government generally, you've got something like, uh, on average, 10% of the workforce is part time, and therefore there would be an immediate cost there if you was looking to do the workforce 
um, reduce it. So you're giving people effectively a 20% pay rise. You'd proportionately have to pay more. So although you might think that you're not paying out any more and you're getting more put for the part time as you would, and if they constitute 10% of your workforce, that's potentially quite a significant cost, isn't it? And Sally from um, Hertfordshire has just mentioned in this a chat that 30% of their workforce is part time. Um, and there's a, been a couple of other comments in the chat about what impact would this have on, on salaries for those that have pro rata salaries and are working part time? Yeah, so we've seen part the, the issue of part time workers, which I would say, you know, we talked about challenges at the beginning. It, it can be one of the, the bigger challenges to work through. Um, we've seen both both local public sector and private sector deal with it quite differently. In some cases, they, they, yeah, there has been that kind of that pay rise, the kind of pro rata pay rise. But in other, you know, for other organisations, that's just not possible. Um, and so what they have done there is um, reduce kind of part time staff uh, hours accordingly, or in some cases, allowed them to acc accrue more annual leave. So rather than just accruing an extra hour kind of one week they'll, they'll, they'll kind of build it up until they get a whole extra day off and um, so there's, there has been various different ways of doing that it hasn't been as straightforward as in every case there's been a kind of pay rise for all part-time workers because for many companies and organizations it's just not possible particularly in the kind of you know the way the economy is right now thanks Joe. Pa Pam, Pam Parks has made a good comment actually about saying that actually in local government um, it would be helpful if you could have some um, definitions of what productivity means, um, and I'm, I think actually most organisations would want to um, uh, understand that. But obviously, because some of the workers' um, productivity is less well defined or or applicable, and that, then that would facilitate um, uh, uh, pushing this as an angle, wouldn't it? There, there is actually. On the ONS website, there's some reference to public sector productivity, but not it's not great. And um, as I made the point in the chat, in researching uh, this this subject uh, for, for the article I wrote a few weeks ago, I couldn't find an awful lot out there. So it is definitely a bit of a gap in in terms of um, the, the the kind of data to you know to to underline the, the case. It just it, you know. It's interesting. We've been asking questions on this call from a technical perspective. You know, the ones about what happens with people who are on part time already. How does four days work if you're already doing four days? It's really easy to flip those into political questions that become attacks. And, and that's precisely why we've got to bottom these questions out and really understand every angle to them, I think, because the people who are going to be against this will be doing it absolutely from a political perspective. So the more data we can find, the more data we can accumulate, the better. Thank you both. Um, just a couple of other questions that I can see on there. Um, someone, uh, Joanne Langford, has this been tried within the education sector, Joe? Are you aware? I know there's I know there's one or two schools that are looking at the moment. There's a, there's a few schools that have already moved to four and a half day weeks um, successfully in the UK. There's a big movement for four day working week in the US at the moment. There's thousands of schools that have moved to four day weeks. So I think they have slightly longer hours on the four days, um, but you know they're definitely having Fridays off. But I think there, there, I know one or two schools that are really looking at how they can make it possible. There's a, there's a set amount of hours that schools have to deliver. I think it's 32 hours of teaching time across the week. So that can make it a bit more challenging. But I know there's definitely, you know, I mean, if we're talking about job retention issues, obviously that's huge for teachers at the moment. So um, there's definitely consideration of it. I think that it's kind of, for the few schools that are interested, it's kind of see, is, is it actually possible? Um, they're trying to work it out. Um, yeah, thank you. There's another question actually from Jill, Jill Johnson. She's asking about the, um, uh, the, the way to approach this subject matter with our own organisations and proposal. Um, and is that some stuff you mentioned comms at the beginning? Joe, that your organisation provide in terms of helping to support um, so, some of this stuff. And I imagine that South Cambridgeshire as well has brought together some, some work on that for um, local authorities. Yeah, I'll, I'll put my email address in the chat because I'm very happy to support on that in terms of like making the case, you know, to the kind of board board level. Um, and then, yeah, there's a there's a bunch of kind of working groups and meetings taking place anyway at the moment with, with quite a few councils. So we can try and involve you in that. So, I'll, yeah, do do drop me a line. And I'll, I'll get in touch. 
Well, we only allow uh, around about 30 minutes on this subject matter. I'm sure it's a subject matter that quite a few people have got more questions and all that. So I'm sorry we're looking to potentially cut this short here. It's a really interesting subject matter. Um, I think it's definitely an appetite for some organisations exploring it um, more than others, especially those that are um, um, suffering sort of uh, significant recruitment retention issues. We've explored some of the pitfalls and hurdles that we might have to explore as local government um, in this arena for to, um, any organisations to potentially take it forward. But I think it's something that will be um, um, looking at a bit more and there'll be a few more organisations, I'm sure, that will be exploring this in more detail over the, 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 the coming months or so. So I um, want to thank um, Ange for the um, um, introduction, for hosting this um, webinar, for Joe for all the work that he's uh, been doing with the four day week campaign and for his contributions today and obviously Aidan as well in terms of his reflections in terms of um, the, the, the political um, aspects that this, um, uh, this subject matter sort of brings into question. Anyway, thank you um, everybody for joining. This is recorded and we will um, share the recording with our um, uh, membership um, at a future point. So I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Have a good Friday. Thanks. Thanks.